Good evening, everyone. It's good to see everyone tonight. Glad everyone has made it back for our study on evangelism. We have been shifting our attention in the lesson last night and now tonight in specific type of people we might encounter as we're having Bible studies and as we're reading the scriptures together. Last night, we put an emphasis on how we would study with someone that was a skeptic, that was coming from a more atheistic or agnostic background. And tonight, we're going to turn our attention to how we might study with someone who is religiously erring, somebody who already has a belief in Jesus and even has an understanding that the scriptures are the word of God. But in the way that they apply or live out the scriptures, we see that there are some flaws there. How do we communicate this message with them? We'll be looking at that tonight in just a second. But I do want to go ahead and do our memory verse for this, uh, for this evening. This is what we've been working on throughout the whole week. And so if you're visiting, just know we've been reading this out loud. So don't be startled whenever we start reading in just a second. So I'm going to say Colossians 4, 5, and 6. And as soon as I start in on that first word, I want everyone to join in with me and read this together out loud. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Your speech must always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. That's what we want to do. Whether it's someone coming from a skeptic background, someone who's coming from a denomination of sorts, or whether it be someone from a background we're just not familiar with, we want our speech to be with grace, seasoned with salt, so we can know how to respond to each person. My plan for tonight is to look at the master teacher, Jesus. We'll spend a lot of the lesson tonight looking at four different people that Jesus or his apostles will work with that I would consider excuse me, religiously erring. And we are going to draw applications as we go. The first one I want to take a look at is Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. Nicodemus was a leader of the Pharisees. And what I particularly love about this account for us that's recorded it's only in John's gospel, is that Jesus spent a lot of time with the Pharisees across all four gospels, didn't he? They're coming up left and right, and yet how often do we see one zeroed in on? How often do we see one of them just picked out of the crowd and his story told? We see it a handful of times, but we especially see it with Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Pharisees. And so I just want to walk through his story tonight Take a little bit of time to address the way Jesus handled somebody like him who is religiously erring and then make some applications of our own as we go through the text. Nicodemus in John chapter three and verse one. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We'll stop there for now. Let's take a second and peel back the way Jesus talks to this man who was religiously erring. Did you notice the first thing that Nicodemus does? He comes to Jesus by night. 
He's ashamed. And as we see the story of Nicodemus play out, we will see more confession from him as John records it for us. But he's already coming to a Jesus at a time when no one else would have. He's ashamed of who he already thinks Jesus is. And as he approaches Jesus, he goes ahead and says to him, look, we know what you're doing has to be from God. And the the authority of Christ has already been established in the heart of this man, Nicodemus. He understands that what Jesus has done can only be done if it is from the Father. And so Jesus pounces on this opportunity in verse 3, as he has already admitted that the authority is from God, and he says to him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know what's really interesting to me about that? uh, This Pharisee, Nicodemus, was a very learned man. He he knew the Torah frontwards and backwards. He himself was a teacher of the law and would have been involved in synagogue teaching. And yet Jesus is even going to him and saying, you must be born again. You have to start over. And this confused Nicodemus at first. As this often happens to Jesus, someone will take something physical that here, excuse me, something spiritual that Jesus said and only apply a physical meaning to it. And so Nicodemus says, well, how can I even be born when I'm old? He, a man can't enter a second time into his mother's womb. And of course, that's not what Jesus had in mind. You needed to be born again. You needed to be born of water and the spirit. That's what I require of you, Nicodemus. Jesus' authority has been established. He recognizes who Jesus is. So now Jesus follows that up with a command. Start over, Nicodemus. Leave everything you know behind about what you think about or what you think you know about the law. And it's time to follow me. But of course, as Jesus gives this command, there's more confusion that Nicodemus has and clarification that Jesus himself will go into more detail with him about. In verse 9, Nicodemus is so confused and said, how can these things be? And Jesus will ridicule him a little bit. How can you, the the teacher of all, how can you be the one asking me and saying that you you don't even understand these things? But I'm telling you, there is a time coming where the Son of Man is going to have to be lifted up in the same way that the serpent was in Numbers 21. When we study with religiously erring people, it is critical that we start with the authority of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the main points we're going to see over and over again as we go through a couple of the different examples in the scriptures tonight. Once authority has been established, the persuasion will come. Because as Nicodemus is commanded to do this, and as this is cleared up for him, we will eventually see a change from him. But I don't want to overlook two really important verses that I do believe are within this dialogue that Jesus has with Nicodemus. And that's verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. It makes it clear that the cross is demonstrating two things. Number one, the love of God. God loved the world so much that he was willing to give up His only son. The world has a completely wrong idea of what it means to love. You see, we walk around with the understanding that if we love something, we keep it. A couple weeks ago, or a couple nights ago, excuse me, I mentioned my grandmother's lemon pie that I love so much, her lemon cake. And if I love it so much, there's a degree in which I want to keep it all for myself. But true love, we know, doesn't keep. True love gives. And that is what God did with Jesus. Think about how much he loved that son. Think about how much he loved us that he was willing to give that son. That is where true love of the father was demonstrated, was on the cross. And we need to understand the difference between a wage and a gift. We would have a hard time rejecting a wage, wouldn't we? Something that we've earned, something that we've worked for. It would be hard to reject something like that. But why would we reject a gift? Ultimately, y'all, it's because of pride. I don't need that. I don't want that. That's not something I need. 
And really what we see from Nicodemus, I believe, at this point in the story, it doesn't tell us what Nicodemus does here in John 3. I think you see Nicodemus throw it back in Jesus' face. He doesn't go and follow Jesus immediately. He's still confused as to who Jesus is. And he's not completely understanding God's plan here. The mercy of God is also something that's demonstrated to Nicodemus. God does not owe us anything, and yet he forgives us. But Nicodemus will not stay the same Nicodemus we see in John 3. Nicodemus appears twice more in the Gospel of John. Look over at John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 50. So, for context reasons, we'll back up to verse 45. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man Jesus speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus. He who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Halfway through the Gospel of John, Nicodemus comes back into the picture as they're trying to throw around the idea of having Jesus brought in and arrested in that moment. And we see that Nicodemus is of sorts a Jesus sympathizer. What has he done wrong? Does our law really judge a man unless it first hears from him? And they throw it right back in his face and say, well, you're, you're not also from Galilee, are you? There's no way that guy can be a prophet. No prophet arises out of Galilee. And the story just moves on. Nicodemus doesn't say anything. Zero confession on his part to this point. And then what happens? In chapter 19, after John has recorded the crucifixion of Jesus Christ... John's account's the only one that does this. In John 19, in verse 39, back up to verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission, so he, uh, he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and a hundred pounds weight. And they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial of the custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in a garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Joseph was not the only one who had a hand in burying Jesus. Nicodemus was too. Do you see the confession that came from Nicodemus in doing this? You see, when someone died in the way that the Romans would, would crucify someone, if you go and take their body and bury them, you know what you're saying? That's my person. That is an open confession of service on Nicodemus's part. And I love seeing that through the Gospel of John. This encounter with Nicodemus started with Jesus establishing his authority with him. But it took a little bit of time for it to take Nicodemus to finally confess Jesus. And so I want to draw a few applications from that tonight. Number one, once authority is established, persuasion will come. As we're stu studying with folks in the religious community, maybe from denomination or, or whatever you want to say there, We've got to start with the authority of Jesus Christ and the authority of the Father. That's where Jesus started with Nicodemus. And really how Nicodemus started with Jesus, recognizing that only someone from God could do the things that Jesus was doing. And once authority has been established, when the command is given, they will yield to what the Father has said. But first, we've got to be on the same page as to who's calling the shots. And the other thing we learned from the encounter with Nicodemus here is that we rely on the blood of Jesus, not on our works alone. Have you ever thought about who the Nicodemuses of our day would be? What religious body or what religious group of people might think similarly to the way a Pharisee would have? 
Is there a religious body out there that relies on solely works to save them? You bet there is. That's really what the entire Catholic doctrine is built around. And that is something I've been able to spend a, a good bit of time with being in the Northeast is Catholicism. I know Adam's dad as well, Greg, has spent some time with it. And when Adam was preaching in Cincinnati, he was talking to me about that. But a group of people who rely on their own works to save them. It is critical that we not only come back to the authority of Christ, but we come back to the blood of Jesus to help them understand. That is what cleanses you from your sins. I've talked with a number of folks who are trying constantly to find the satisfaction in saving themselves by checking as many boxes as they can and hoping that if only I do enough good things, it will outweigh the bad and I will work my way into heaven. And you know what the problem with that is? Is the bad stuff is still all there. Jesus in his conversation with Nicodemus said, God came to fix that. He came to wipe all of that away. Now, that is not to say that there are means to the conditions, that there are things that we need to do to, in response to the gospel message. But again, in that situation, it's not us saving ourselves. It's still 100% the blood of Christ that saves us. Talk with people about that who might be like a Nicodemus. Help them understand that there's no amount of good things you could do to tip the scales. You need to rely on Jesus. Help them see that in the gospels. And also be patient with them. How long do you think Nicodemus, if he was a ruler of the Pharisees, I would imagine he was older than most of the Pharisees we read about in scriptures. How long do you think he'd been living his life the way he'd been living his life? It's no wonder it took him as long as it did to finally submit and yield to Jesus as his king. There is nothing wrong, y'all, with having a one or two year long study with somebody. And if I had more time, I could honestly probably do four or five more lessons after the evangelism series on how to keep studies going and how to, how to, or when to know when to cut studies off. But honestly, I think we're sometimes too quick to say, well, we're just casting our pearls before swine. It's time to get out of here. Jesus didn't do that with Nicodemus. He was patient with him. And we got to learn to be patient with folks like this who have spent their entire life living with a particular system in mind. And now they're learning from the truth of the gospel that it's not so. Be patient with them. Think about how patient the Lord has been with me and you. That's not to say we sugarcoat the way that they're living or sugarcoat the truth. We need to be patient in those moments, just like Jesus was. Number two, let's take some time to look at the Samaritan woman in John chapter four. So turn your Bibles over to John chapter four. I love using her as an example because it's, it's no coincidence, to me at least, that John 3 and John 4 are right next to each other. Because no sooner than Jesus talks with a religiously erring Pharisee named Nicodemus, he encounters this Samaritan woman. In John 4, in verse 7, it says, There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We'll stop there and work our way through the text. You see, not only did Jesus was he not supposed to have interactions with a woman, Jesus was especially not supposed to be having an inter interactions with a Samaritan woman. The Samaritans were considered to be like a half-blood, half-race version of the Jews. At one time, they had started intermingling and intermarrying with the different nations around them. And they had adopted the view that only the Pentateuch was the Word of God. So they only believe in Genesis through Deuteronomy. And for that reason, they didn't take central worship to be done in Jerusalem. They believed that it could only be done at Mount Gerizim, which was around the region that Jesus is at. And he'll make reference to this, uh, this mountain, um, and so will the Samaritan woman, in just a little bit. This woman was off. Jesus will later say that salvation is from the Jews and that you have that completely wrong. But I want us to see how he, meet, how he meets her erring religious thoughts. He meets them by telling her, that he has living water for her. I love that. In verse 9, or excuse me, in verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God 
And who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Stop there for now. What does she do? She mistakes Jesus' spiritual comment for something that's physical. Sound familiar? It's exactly what Nicodemus had done back in chapter 3. And so Jesus goes on to explain this a little bit further to her. That he has living water. That, in verse 14, he can give someone that will become a well of water springing up to eternal life. And man, was that appealing to her. Again, I don't know if she fully understands the spiritual connotations of this. But have you ever wondered why this woman was coming out in the heat of the day to draw water. You see, in that culture, it was oftentimes that the women would go early in the morning while it was still cool to go out and draw water. This woman was doing it later in the day. We later learned that this woman had had five husbands. Perhaps she was an outcast. Perhaps this idea of having a well that springs up and she can just have for herself sounds really good. But of course, Jesus, again, does not have physical in mind. He has spiritual. And he's also trying to appeal to the thirst of this woman. In verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. Why do we get thirsty? Because we're tired. We're weary from doing something. Have you ever been exercising, maybe working? outside or maybe you've just been on the run or or going to play basketball or something like that you get back you're you're really hot and sweaty and the only thing in the kitchen is maybe a a coke does that really taste good as it's going down no the coke doesn't quite quench your thirst the same way a glass of water would jesus is going to point out to this woman that she's been going to coke (laughs) Or something else to quench her thirst. When really she should have been going to living water in him. In verse 15, the woman says, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty. Nor have to come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, go call your husband here. And the woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said, you've said correctly, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. She's been going to the wrong well. She's thirsty, and she keeps drinking the wrong thing. Men have been her well. And Jesus addresses this right off the bat with her. That's not going to fill you up the way that you think it is. That's why you keep going to the next man and the next man and the next man. Is everyone in here, have you felt that way before? Going to the wrong thing to fill you up? We've been in the shoes of this Samaritan woman before. And so, what does she say to this in verse 19? Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. (laughs) She deflects. In verse 21, or in verse 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. She deflects. She doesn't want to talk about this problem she's having. Instead, she decides to talk about a doctrinal problem. Well, us Samaritans over here, we know that we're supposed to be worshiping at Mount Gerizim per Deuteronomy. And you Jews say it should be over 
in Jerusalem. I love how Jesus meets this. He does say that salvation is from the Jews, that you, you've got the idea wrong. But secondly, there's an hour coming where the mountain isn't going to matter. You can worship the Father in spirit and in truth anywhere you're going to be. This will soon be a point that just doesn't matter. And it's at this point that she recognizes in verse 25 that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. He reveals to her that he's the Messiah. Sorry, I got behind on the PowerPoint. He tells her that he is the Christ. In other words, he establishes authority. He is the king. And by his ability to know this thing about her that otherwise he wouldn't have been able to know, she knows for certain that he is the Messiah. And throughout the week, by the way, if you're visiting, we have been referencing what happens after this when she goes back to Samaria and she tells everyone she knows that she has met the Messiah. What are we supposed to learn from this woman? What do we learn from this interaction that Jesus has with her? Well, if you'll allow me a few points. Number one, get to the point. Sin is sin. Jesus was quick to address this spiritual problem within her. When you're studying with somebody that's coming from a denominational background or coming from a background where they already believe in Jesus, they're not going to be shocked at the idea that they could be lost or that they could be in sin. Don't be afraid to humbly and gently point out to them that whatever they're involved in is sinful. Let the scriptures do that. Let, as we've been talking about, the gospel of Mark reveal those things in their life. But do not beat around the bush. Jesus was straightforward with this woman that you have a problem and I know what it is. You're going to the wrong well. You have had five husbands. That's not okay. It's all right for us to be straightforward with people as well. And it's also a great opportunity to talk with people about how they see sin. I've talked and studied with a lot of folks across different churches and different backgrounds who claim to be a Christian, but in the way that they live, they are directly violating what the Lord's will for them is. It is so important from the get-go with studying with folks like this that we figure out how seriously they take sin and encourage them to take sin seriously. Number two. Expect deflection at times as you're studying with folks. As you're confronting possible lifelong traditions in people that they've always done their entire life, once they start to feel convicted, it is not rare for them to try and deflect and change the subject. There was a study that I was in recently with somebody who's been dealing with some spiritual problems that, that I, I hope that they will continue to go to the Lord for or start to go to the Lord for. And I had an open door with this individual. They actually opened up to me about a grieving process that they're going through. Had some questions about what the scriptures have to say about it. We had about a 15 minute conversation about it. This man actually started crying as we were discussing these things. And no sooner than that tear dropped off his face and hit his Bible, he looked up at me and said, can we talk about the thousand year reign? He deflected. He was vulnerable. He, he was in a position where he didn't want to reveal anymore. So he deflected. And so you know what I did with him? I deflected with him. He had revealed what he wanted to. We had addressed what he had talked about. And so we came over here and we talked about what the scriptures say about the thousand year reign. And I answered those questions for him. But guess what I'm circling back around to next time? That conversation. Jesus is patient with this woman as she deflects, but he is still quick to bring it back around to his messiahship or his authority. Because once his authority has been established, it's now time to listen to him. He's got a mission for her. It's not time for her to just say, oh, cool, I met the Messiah and go on living her life the way that she was. It's time to listen and obey. And this is really, again, where it all hinges with people, y'all. This is where the rubber meets the road 
with people that might be religiously erring. Who do they believe has the authority in their life? Do they believe that it's King Jesus? Or do they believe that it's their pastor or elders or local leadership? Do they believe that it's in some man like Martin Luther or John Calvin? Or is their authority pledged to Jesus Christ? We got to get that on the table from the get go with folks. The other thing I find really powerful about this is that where we worship and specifically how we worship does matter. Jesus does not throw this question to the side, but makes clear that there will come a time where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I think there is an appropriate conversation to be had with those who are religiously erring about what the Father has approved for our worship to Him. And I also just want to point out the flow that Jesus has, or that we see from this woman in this story. Number one, the gospel entered her heart. Number two, it confronted the sin in her life. Number three, she receives the Savior. And then fourth, she goes and tells others. Do not underestimate the gospel's ability to work on people's heart, whether skeptic or religiously erring. I love the example of this woman. Uh, we could spend more time talking about her, but there's a couple of other points I want to talk about tonight. The third one I want to look at, the third and fourth one go similarly together, was Apollos. Do you remember how Apollos got his start? Look over at Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, and we're going to pick up in verse 24. This is one of those sections where Luke takes, takes a time out from talking about Paul to talk about something else that happened. And in Acts 18 and verse 24... We're introduced to a Jew named Apollos. He was an Alexandrian by birth, eloquent man, and he came to Ephesus and was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only though with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him, wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Apollos was a false teacher. He was teaching that John the Baptist's baptism was all that someone needed. When in fact, that there was new information that came along, that Jesus had died, he had resurrected, and you needed to be baptized in his name. He understood some things about Jesus, but he didn't understand everything. Apollos was an excellent speaker. We know that not only from what it says about him here in verses 24 and 25, but we actually also know that from 1 Corinthians, where it seems like the Corinthians had a particular favor toward Apollos because of his ability to orate and speak in a way that Paul himself could not. It would have been really easy for someone like Apollos to throw his hands up and say, you know what, I think I'm doing pretty good here. I've got a good following happening. Why don't you all leave me alone and I'll keep teaching what I want to. But is that the heart that Apollos has? Apollos had a heart that was humble and submitted to the truth when he saw it. Y'all, we might meet people like that. I've met people like that. Do not go into every conversation with someone that believes differently than you do religiously and just assume that they're not going to listen to what you have to say. I've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of sitting down with somebody thinking when I get to the teaching on baptism, they are going to throw a fit and been pleasantly surprised that they agree with me because they've been reading the scripture for themselves. Don't assume things on people. Apollos humbly submitted to the truth and changed his entire teaching and ministry based off of the truth that was revealed to him. And here's what I love is the story that's directly connected with Apollos by the way, one of the worst chapter breaks in Acts, in my opinion, is in, in between 18 and 19. Look at 19.1. So it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. Where does Paul go? He goes through the upper country and gets to Ephesus and found some 
disciples. It's important that you see there that these people are called disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into then what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were in all about 12 men. So here we learn that Paul is in Ephesus. And he meets 12 guys who have never even heard of the Holy Spirit. The only thing they've been acquainted with is the baptism of John in the same way that Apollos was. And when they hear the news of Jesus Christ, they are then baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. These folks also humbly submitted to the truth. Here's what we want to pull away from folks like this. Number one, be kind and gentle as you correct people like this. They're on a journey for the truth. Do not go in there expecting to just slap them around with your Bible and tell them how awful they are because they've never seen this before. Maybe they've just simply never read it. Maybe it's never been presented to them before. Be patient with them and be kind as you explain these truths to them. And number two, humble hearts of true disciples will receive truth. Did you see what it called these folks before they were baptized in verse 19 and in 19.1? It calls these folks disciples. They knew a little bit, but more information was revealed and they submitted to it. You all heard me talk some in one of the lessons about Sister Violet. Violet came to us through Instagram, actually. She had found us because one of the sisters in Christ there in Harrisburg had been um, posting about our worship services and they got connected that way. And Violet came from a Mennonite background. Um, she had left the Mennonite church five years ago due to her convictions on tradition. She was getting fed up with them teaching traditions as if they were commandment. And so she went seeking for truth elsewhere. She knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. She knew that He was deity. She knew that He died for her sins. And she even believed she was baptized for the forgiveness of her sins. And after a few months of studying with her, she said, well, I'd like to join with this local church. And we said, that'd be great, but we have a couple other questions we have for you. And the first one is, what was your understanding of baptism when you were baptized? Well, it was for the forgiveness of sins. I know I did it to become a disciple of Jesus. Great, great, great. Yeah, I was poured when I was 14. Okay. So now we, we reveal some more information. Did you know that baptize literally means immerse? The Greek word for baptize is baptizo. Uh, it, it was transliterated in our Bibles today, and so sometimes that gets lost. But it literally means to be immersed or to dip or to pour. And you don't even have to see that in the Greek. You can see that in Acts 8 when Philip and the eunuch go down in the water and come back up. Or in John 3 when he's baptizing and he's over there baptizing where there was much water. And we go through all these passages with her. And she says, I've never known that. Never seen that before. But this is what the scriptures teach. So I need to be immersed for the forgiveness of my sins. And that very day, we took her and baptized her in the name of Jesus Christ. Sister Violet had been a disciple of Jesus for years. She had been following his teaching and her conduct and her lifestyle. But she needed more information. And she went to seek it out. And she found it. Be ready to meet people like this and be ready to be patient with them as they hear the gospel message. A few final applications on this. Jesus was so patient with all types of people, especially as you consider Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, two completely different scenarios. The Samaritan woman submitting to Jesus within the same conversation and Nicodemus 
taking the almost entire gospel of John for us to finally learn that he confesses Jesus Christ. That is going to happen sometimes. The gospel is going to take time to weigh on people's hearts. Number two, Jesus had answers for all, but only when they were willing to submit to his authority. Again, that is where it starts. And if you're curious to know how I establish the authority of Christ with people, if you weren't here on Sunday, we went through the gospel of Mark with the way I go through it with people. And you can establish the authority of Christ right there in chapter one and in chapter two. And so we're going to accomplish this by having a textual approach in our studies. I'll say it again. It does not matter just about what the background is. I want to start in a gospel. I want to read with people about it. And without undoing too much of what I did last night with studying with a skeptic, I have at times read through portions of the Gospels with skeptics, knowing that they don't believe in Jesus, simply because they have a misunderstanding of who Jesus is. There's a lot of folks who say things about Jesus without actually having read who Jesus was. In those moments, I like to always come back and encourage them, instead of you just telling me what you saw on Facebook about Jesus, read the Gospel of Mark before our next study, and then tell me what you know about Jesus. Odds are it's completely different. Are you studying with somebody that's Calvinistic? I would encourage you to read Romans with them in context at some point. Oftentimes, as I get into these discussions with folks, specifically with total depravity and the, tulip, the whole tulip system, um, Calvinism as a whole with once saved, always saved, a lot of their passages come back to Romans. And I will amen their passage in Ro passages in Romans all day long because it's in the scriptures. But there's a reason why most of their passages come from chapters 8, 9, and on. It's because they don't know what chapters 1 through 3 say. Romans needs to be read in context. And so I love to do that with people who are willing to do that with me. And I realize it's a big book, but I think it is so worth it in the end to see it. Someone who's coming from a more Catholic background. The Gospel of Matthew is one I tend to favor toward a little bit more than the other three. Simply because Matthew does a good job at pointing out some apparent and obvious contradictions. Things that the Catholic Church teaches about Jesus where the Gospel of Matthew will say the complete opposite. And so... Over the course of those chapters, it will point out direct contradictions. Call no man on earth father. Um, the, the perpetual virginity of Mary, it says in Matthew 1 that he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to Jesus. And so there's some very obvious contradictions there that will be revealed as I read through that gospel with, something, with someone coming from a Catholic background. Or maybe you're studying with somebody with a misunderstanding of the Lord's church. They don't know what its purpose is or its function is, or they don't know how different things should be done. I will just read the book of Acts with them. Because what's really cool about the book of Acts is, of course, the epistles sprinkle in with those and complement the way the work of the church should be as you go. I love playing that game with people. You name me a background of somebody and I will name you the book of the Bible I will go through with them. Let the text do the work for you. Hope this is helpful, um, gives you a, a good enough of an overview as to how I study with someone coming from a religiously erring background. There are so many different places and so many different churches out there that more could be said. And so if you want to add to this or have anything you want to say to me afterwards, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Thanks for your attention tonight. At this time, we're going to have an opportunity to sing an invitation song. And for anybody who wants to know more about what they need to do to obey the gospel, if you are ready to believe in Jesus, confess your sins and repent of them and be baptized, you'll have that opportunity. Or if you're just somebody who needs the prayers of this local congregation and wants help in some way, we'd love to pray with you as well. If we can help you in any way tonight, won't you come forward now as we stand and as we sing.